Ownership is a different thing now. Um, I think for some of us that are older, it might have been even physical possession at the time. Certainly in the 80s, it was excessive ownership. Uh, now it's uh, maybe less ownership, more access, right? Um, and the lines of, like I said, discretion are blurring. Uh, we've got uh, communities that have uh, not the best interest of organizations and individuals um, in so many ways now. The speed of that is so much faster. To do uh, conduct a physical crime in the 70s or 80s, you had to use physical force, took a long time, very physically dangerous, could get yeah. shot. Right yeah. like now, the... Um, Check fraud? Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, the classic criminological distinction would be that there are only two types of crime, crimes of force and crimes of fraud. Either you do it by deception okay. and stealth, or you do it by overwhelming physical power. So what about, so now there, there's also a, um, a distortion yeah. in the risk-reward, right? I mean, yeah. somebody hacking their way in from Russia into an American bank, is it, how likely is it for them to get caught, yeah. right? And then we've got an org organizations that have built their infrastructures on information technology, and they cannot do without them now. Right. You call up an airline and they say, well, we can't make your reservation now because our system is down and you think, well, I'm never going to fly you again, right? Um, but aren't they doing those companies a favor by showing how vulnerable their systems are? Well, I'm sure there are some that would rationalize it that way. Yeah, <laughs> the classic kind of black hat yeah, exactly. Exactly. rationalization. Sure, I should have been a hard <laughs> where we're, we're, Yeah, we're showing you hashtag. So we're doing you a favor in the last right. run. Yeah. Yeah. That, that person who mucked you on the way did you a favor in showing how you should have done it. <laughs> That's right. You really yeah. should yeah. have been. But they're the kind that of people person. that the conventional mm. organizations then employ once they've got legit. <laughs> well, we talked about that. No, none of the offending parties actually think they're offending anything when they do it. But that's what I'm saying. Right? The, the boundaries have become blurred. Exactly. As to what's right and what's wrong. Well, I, I think that's always been the case with offending behaviour. Sure. I think I think the issue with with kind of ICTs uh, and related technologies is it changes the state of play in terms of rule-breaking, law-breaking behavior or victimizing others because A, you have action at distance, mm -hmm. yeah. you have uh, and potentially anonymity, yeah. right. and the internet works and related technologies work as force multipliers, yep. i.e. Yeah. you don't have to defraud people one at a time by going door to door, you can try to defraud 50 million people simultaneously yeah. through a you know, coordinated attack running at the same time. Yeah. You put those three things together and you effectively amplify the impact of things. So I can be victimized within my own home, within block between my four walls with a burglar alarm on yeah. via that thing yeah. or by the thing in my pocket. Yeah, right. yeah. And it can be not somebody, nobody has to come and find me to do it. They well, can do it from the other side of the planet. Conversely, it, it adds to the seduction for those who are oriented to do those, that kind of thing, doesn't it? Mm. it, makes on, it on a <coughs> purely risk-reward basis. Right, absolutely. Yeah, rational kind of choice. It's you know, completely what, what skewed I, off now. What can I get from this? <laughs> and what are my chances of getting nabbed and you know, pain and pleasure? Yeah. So how should corporations who read the kind of magazines I write for look at this? Because you've got Thank you for asking. people <laughs> saying, oh, buy you this software and protect your organization. Or, but is it really as simple as that? So one strategy would be the moat and drawbridge strategy. But if you want to go get the post, if you want to go get some milk, it's awfully inconvenient just to go out and yeah. every day to do something like that, right? One of the strategies that I'm sure your readers have to think about is the absolute impenetrable defense strategy, which we already know is incomplete. Because we already know they're getting APTs, we already know they're getting fished, we already know they're getting in. Uh, so is perimeter defense, absolute perimeter defense, Feasible, uh, logical, um, or even sane now, knowing that it really is not a question of if, it's a question of when, isn't it? And could it be somebody inside? Could be somebody outside. inside as well. 
in it, you, you inadvertently. Inside if, you're, if, you're, if all your data is in the cloud. It's more, well, it's more likely to be inside than outside. I mean, the, the latest studies that kind of cert people at Carnegie Mellon, their latest study shows again, they survey kind of, you know, American business and they find that most report, in terms of the damages incurred, they come more from inside right. intrusions, yeah. exfiltration of data, for example, you know, from the inside, rather than from what's usually publicized, the idea of kind of hackers, right. you know, downloading malware. Well, one of the, the most damaging uh, studies showed, uh, one of the studies showed one of the most damaging traits is that the perpetrators are able to get in and exfiltrate the data much more rapidly than organizations are able to detect it. So they get in in seconds and days, and it takes them days and weeks to exfiltrate the data, but organizations don't un find out about it for yeah. weeks and months. 18 months is, is the average that, that, that malware sits on your system before it's spotted. And you don't spot it, somebody else does, one of your customers. You don't even find it. And they don't even, right. So they don't even go after the crown jewels right away. They'll go in, cover the tracks, close the door behind them, and sit and wait. And just wait and watch. And then find what, you know, find a way to get to what they want. And then, so what do we tell your readers? <laughs> just, well, again, it depends which of your readers and, uh, and you know, what, uh, what their risk appetite is, what their crown jewels are. Um, and, and where, their, where their priorities lie. Then, then comes things like how, how big is that budget? Um, you okay. know, um, some people are willing to risk loss because the cost of preventing it is higher than the value of what they're going yeah. to lose. Um, and, and that's a valid strategy if you've done the sums and, as opposed to by if default. If you build that into your business model, as yeah. long as the failure isn't catastrophic, then you just write it off as a normal cost. Well, that's like business. theft for retail, right? Yeah. You know it's going to happen. You just do it. Yeah. You, you build, build it, it into the price. Yeah, if you had you know, people with machine yeah. guns on all the doors of all the shops, you know, there'd probably be less theft. But, you know, <coughs> less shops. So it's, a case of, <laughs> so it's a case of working out what you need to protect. You can't protect everything. Well, I'll give you two different examples from my speaking with different kinds of organizations. One um, had much more pressure from the business side than the security side. And their joke was, if you change jobs seven times within this company, you'll have access to every system we have. But we have no idea how long it takes to get you out when you quit. So, and it was a research-based pharma. Not good.